Pilots, and welcome to our third and last training Tuesday. Um, we're excited about this one. It's on actuated valves. And when we had our first training Tuesday, we went through the different product categories, and actuated valves is one that Griswold's been in uh, for the least amount of time. And so we're excited to go through this with you. I'm going to go ahead and mute everybody just so that we don't have uh, any interruptions with being put on hold or anything. You can ask questions in the chat screen if you need to, and then we'll have questions at the time, at the end, verbal questions. All right, so you may recognize this chart from our first training Tuesday where we had the overall Griswold product line. Um, we have the product categories on the left side and then the product categories that Griswold participates in and then the product categories that most either balanced valve manufacturers are in or actuated valve manufacturers. So we had talked about this on our first session that each of these rows is basically a different way to control the flow. And so in this presentation, we're gonna be focusing on these three red areas and that would be actuated control. And I know when we first entered the actuated valve market in early 2000s, um, it seemed a little overwhelming and somewhat daunting because we were on the mechanical side of the industry and so many people on the mechanical side of the industry have been told by for years and years that the controls in the control side of the industry are very complex, they're hard to select, that kind of thing. And we realized right away as we started designing products and then selling and manufacturing products that they really aren't the mystery that so many controls people paint them out to be. Um, simply, an actuated valve controls how much flow goes to a coil or a terminal unit. So each coil has a control valve. There's some kind of electronic actuator, could be pneumatic as well, but typically uh, nowadays it's electronic actuator on the valve. And that has a motor on it that can control the valve position. So the actuator receives a signal from the thermostat on the wall in the room or from the control system, which is receiving its signal from the thermostat. And it simply tells the valve to either rotate to more open position or rotate to a more closed position. So in our type of valve, it rotates either clockwise or rotates counterclockwise. And the control system, depending on what type it is, will either rotate it all the way to open or all the way to closed, or it will rotate it to some position in the middle. So you may recognize this graph from our first session. Um, this would be an actuated control valve graph where we look at flow versus pressure differential. And each color on the graph is a different valve position. And so the yellow, for example, would be about halfway open valve position. So that actuated control valve is going to move either from full open to closed to one of these positions in the middle. And then as the pressure differential in the system changes, there's going to be a flow change and that valve will just ride that curve. Because the goal is to control the heat transfer and therefore the temperature in the zone, as the valve is in a fixed position, it's done, mod it's done rotating. Now as there's pressure changes, as that valve is riding that curve, um, the temperature will change in the zone. And so the thermostat will sense that it has changed and that thermostat has some kind of bandwidth where it will allow it to be within a certain plus or minus uh, temperature. And so that thermostat will eventually send a signal that says, okay, you're getting too much heating or too much cooling, and so we need to rotate the valve to a different position. So it's actually very simple. Most coils um, have some kind of control valve on them, and so we wanna go through and look at the different types of control valves that are used in the industry, and look at some of the benefits and features of, of each of the different types of control valves. So here I've got a list of the four common types of control valves. Um, globe valves, ball valves, butterfly valves, and zone plug valves. Most of you know Griswold's actuated control valves are the ball valves type. 
Um, if you're looking at the different types, one of the first areas that people look at, whether they realize it or not, is the price level that they're looking for in their control valve. Typically, globe valves um, have the highest price point, whereas ball valves have a fairly low price point compared to a globe valve. It's very well accepted in the industry that a globe valve is going to be much higher than a ball valve. In large sizes, a globe valve will be much higher than a butterfly valve. Um, then there's the fourth type, which is a zone valve, and that could either be a plug valve or a paddle valve. And it's understood in the industry that those are typically the lowest price point of all of the control valve types. Now, as we look at the rest of the data, you'll see the trade-off when you have the lowest price, you trade off in some of the features and benefits, you trade off some of that for the zone valve being the lowest. So the next category would be close-off pressure. The close-off delta P is defined as the pressure the valve can close off against without having a substantial amount of leak by. Most valves are rated for either an ANSI class three leakage or ANSI class four. Griswold's R2 way are ANSI class four and R3 way is ANSI class three. And so the close off pressure differential is how much the valve can close off against and not exceed that ANSI class rating. So in a globe valve, they have fairly low close off pressure differentials. Um, they're not able to close off against high pressure differentials. Ball valve historically has been the absolute highest close off di differential pressure. Butterflies are also like uh, globe valves and they're fairly low. And then on the extreme, the zone valve, it has typically the lowest close off pressure differential. So for example, a ball valve is typically about 100 or more. A zone valve is typically about 10 pounds. Um, sometimes they have a higher torque actuator that they can put on, and so that gets them up to 30 pounds differential. So what that means is if you're on a branch and you need to close off against the full pressure and you've got on that branch, maybe it's like we talked about last week, something closest to the pump, so there's going to be more pressure differential in that section. Um, maybe they need to close off against 40 or 50 pounds. Um, a zone valve won't be able to close off against that. So it means that it will have more leak by. So you'll have more leak by going to the coil um, because you can't close off sufficiently against that. So again, a ball valve is typically the highest. Um, the sizes also play in. Um, the sizes for a globe valve typically half inch to eight inch with the most common being half inch to two inch but they do have many globe valve manufacturers that go up to eight inch. Ball valves historically were half inch to two inch. Um, there's an asterisk there just saying traditional ball valves. This doesn't apply to Griswold. Butterflies typically start at two and a half inch and go up to 20 inch. And then zone valves, because of their small size and their low price point and their low close off differential pressure, they're typically only available in half and three quarter inch size. Some manufacturers make them in up to one inch size. So for a zone valve, it does have a size limitation in that you can only get it typically in the smaller sizes. Um, the CVs that are available, we haven't talked about CV yet, but we'll talk about CV um, as we go through this presentation. And the CVs, that are typically available with the globe valves are what's required for a line size product. Ball valves, and you can imagine, just imagine the port in a ball typically, so not Griswold, but anyone else's ball valve, typically have a very, very high CV. So that's why the tradition started of, if you have a one inch package, putting a half or three quarter inch uh, valve on for control to get the CVs that you need. Um, and then for, Butterfly valves, they're typically fairly high CVs as well um, because, again, it's a huge open area. And then zone valves are more in line with what you would actually need for the line. Um, equal percent, we're going to visit that in a few slides, but it's important to uh, the performance of the product. And so tr traditionally, globe valves are designed to be equal percent. Most ball valves are not. Again, this doesn't apply to Griswold, but that's kind of one of the downsides of ball valves in the market is that they're not equal percent unless it's Griswold. 
Um, butterflies are definitely not equal percent and zone valves as well. And then just the basic movement is different. Globe valves are typically an up and down linear movement, whereas ball valves and butterflies are a quarter turn. And zone valves, depending on the style, it can be a linear plug or it can be like a quarter turn paddle. So there's a few different uh, ways that a zone valve can be set up. So like I said, we're gonna visit equal percent in this next slide. So I'm gonna jump to that. So what does equal percent mean? This is um, somewhat confusing. Um, basically, when a valve is closed in an equal percent increment, so let's say a 10% increment, the flow decreases by an equal percent number from the previous value. So if you have equal percent change in position, you get an equal percent change in the flow. So you, you could have, say, for a 10% change in position, a 5% change in the flow. So it's not saying that it's a linear relationship. It's actually going to be a curved relationship. And um, so you measure the slope and that's how you know how much equal percent it is. The reason that it's important and the reason that, um, again, ball valves not being equal percent historically in the market and butterflies not being equal percent, the reason it's a problem is because of heat transfer. If you look at the graph on the right, you've got your average coil characteristic. And I'm sure you guys recognize this from our previous classes where you've got your average coil characteristic. So as your ball's opening and you have a certain amount of flow, you get the most heat transfer in that beginning part of the coil's performance. So you're gonna get more heat transfer in the beginning. And that again makes sense because we know that the less, the slower the flow moves through the coil, the more heat transfer you're gonna get out of that flow. So a coil performs to this gray curve right here. This gray curve is how a coil is going to uh, respond to flow. So the BTU heat transfer is going to respond to the flow that way. So the goal with any valve, any control valve, is to mirror that and to not have a huge change in flow in the beginning so that we can take advantage of the coil's beginning part where it's gonna have more heat transfer. So the goal for equal percentage flow is this green curve. And there's different slopes in this curve. So this is a generic um, curve. There's standards in the industry that you follow to get the slope, um, how you need it to be, to be equal percentage. But in general, this green curve here is going to represent an actuated valve. And like I said, globe valves typically are designed to that green curve so that they can mirror the heat transfer and get a linear result. A ball valve, and many of you have tried to open a ball valve or tried to use a ball valve for some kind of balancing purpose, and you know that as you start to open that ball valve, you get a huge change in flow that jumps as that ball valve starts to open. So that's this graph here where the flow is a drastic change as you start to open and then it doesn't really do much for a while. And so when we designed the optimizer for the manual valve, the quick set, we had designed this optimizer in the ball so that as the ball opened, the smaller portion of the optimizer is what saw the flow first. So instead of having a huge jump in flow as that ball opened and being almost full flow at say 20% open, we designed the optimizer so that it had this parabolic shape so that we would limit the flow in this beginning part here. So that optimizer really was a key thing for Griswold. And again, we were designing that for the mechanical contractors. We were designing that for balancing contractors to be able to use to set the quick set valve easier. But it immediately got the attention of everyone in the actuated valve industry because again, ball valves were a fairly low price way to do control valves, but the problem was they were not equal percent. So they didn't have the good control. So by designing the ball valve the way we did with that optimizer insert inside controlling the flow, we solved one of the main downsides in the industry to an actuated control valve. So that's the optimizer, our patented optimizer. And you'll see that that optimizer in all of the Unimizer products. It also is in the PIG-V and the Automizer that we'll see as we go through. 
The second benefit of that optimizer is it brings the CV, the CV value down. So a full port ball valve is about 11 CV in three quarter inch size. Um, most people don't need a CV that high in three quarter inch. So by closing the open area of that ball and inserting that optimizer, we have the second benefit that overcomes balls and that is that the line size, the CVs need to be about line size or one size lower. So again, ball valves were incredibly oversized and so therefore they just provided really horrible control um, not just on the equal percent side, but just extreme overflow because of their high CVs. So this optimizer insert selected or solved that secondary problem. In the unimizer valve, the other issue that is common with all actuated ball valves is the torque. And if you've tried to rotate the isolator R or the isolator S, you know that um, that torque can get pretty high and especially as you go up in size, you need a pretty heavy lever arm, a uh, long lever arm to be able to rotate that ball. So the other downside to ball valves historically in the market was the torque that was required to rotate the ball. Now it was great because they would take a huge amount of pressure differential across them. So you didn't have any leak by, but the torque required to do that was excessive. And so the actuators were very large on the, actuated ball valves that used to be in the market. So we designed our patented low torque seal. And so if you're looking at this image, you can see the ball in the middle and there's a white Teflon seat on each side. And within that seat, there's a groove. And in that groove is an EPDM O-ring. And that EPDM O-ring acts as like a cushion on each side of the ball so that the torque is drastically less than anyone else's actuated ball valve on the market. So for example, a half inch and three quarter inch valve, we only require less than 20 inch pounds um, of torque, just like everybody else. But one inch, an inch and a quarter, we still only require a 35 inch pound actuator. Now, all other, act all other valve manufacturers that make an actuated ball valve, um, all of theirs require at one inch, an inch and a quarter that you go up in size to the next actuator and so that would be a 75 inch pound actuator well the actuator is about two-thirds of the price of the valve so if you're increasing your actuator size at one inch an inch and a quarter product you've really jumped your price in the market for a one inch an inch and a quarter product and this actually continues because at inch and a half everyone else has to uh, use a 120 to 133 inch pound actuator. So they've jumped to the, the third level of actuator. So for Griswold, for half inch all the way to three inch, we can handle closing off against 130 PSI with a 35 inch pound actuator. This is a big cost benefit to you and to your customers. And oftentimes we get asked, can I mount this you know, so-and-so's actuator on your two-inch unimizer or your two-inch pig V, and they want to put an actuator that's 120 inch pounds because that's what they're used to. Everybody else has to put that large actuator on there. And so it's always fun to be able to say, nope, our valve, you only need to go to 35 inch pounds. Please don't exceed it. There's no need to. It's just a waste of actuator torque and therefore a waste of your money. So It'd be nice if every job was all two inch product because then you would definitely see the cost benefit to using the Griswold products. Um, but typically that's not how jobs are set up and you've got jobs that have half inch product, three quarter inch, and you have less of the one inch and even less of the inch and a quarter. But the price difference on the actuator side is so substantial and this goes all the way up to the six inch product for us for the unimizer. Um, for the six inch product, the actuator price is so much less that we're our valve plus actuator is less than 50% of what the market is for someone else's comparable product. So this low torque seal was really a huge benefit to the Unimizer product and it's incorporated into all of our actuated valves. The other major benefit to all of our actuated valves is the patented repairable SIM. That's this section right here. And so you can see the two Teflon seats 
the O-ring, and then this groove for grease. And I know we've discussed this in previous classes, and you guys are all experts on it already. Um, but this patented repairable stem is a big deal in actuated valves. Maybe an isolation valve, it's not as much because you're not cycling, and so you're really only needing to repair the stem if there's a chemical compatibility issue or an overheating. But in an actuated situation, the stem will be the second thing that will fail due to cycling. The first being the actuator, and it's accepted that the actuator is going to fail first um, because it's cycling constantly and it's using torque to hold that ball in place. But the second thing is the stem because the stem is constantly rotating. And so having a repairable stem in an actuated valve product is actually a bigger deal than it is in the isolation product because there will be situations where just because of pure cycling, there's going to be a stem failure, not because of the stem uh, having a defect, but because of just the wear and tear on these Teflon seats and these O-rings. Now, again, this product's been the Unimizer with this next generation stem. Um, that version of the stem was released in 2007, and we still haven't really seen any actuated valve stem replacement request. Um, but a 10-year life on an actuated stem is also exceedingly good for the market. The actuated valves, the actuator is expected to cycle to 100,000 100, cycles in about 10 years, and that's what they hope that it will live, but they accept that three to five years in a modulating system, you could hit that 100,000 cycles. So three to five years, they're going to start replacing the actuators. At five to 10 years, they could start replacing the stem. Well, our stem, we've cycle tested it to 600,000 cycles, and it was still leak proof, didn't have any leaks externally. So the next generation repairable stem is a feature that your end users would probably care about the most because their building will have a longer life with those products. The third major benefit in our actuated valve product line is the universal mounting plate. And we talked about this before. The universal mounting plate is compatible with the major name brand actuators on the market. So again, it has to be a quarter turn actuator, but it's compatible with Siemens, Johnson, Belimo, Honeywell, Schneider Electric, Bray, KMC, um, so because of that, our valve can be stocked at your customer's location, or um, they can bring the valves in and bring the actuators from somewhere else and put them together. It's very quick. Um, the handle's off when you get the valve, so you put the actuator on. There's a little clip right here that slides into the back of the actuator. There's a slot back there. You tighten the wing nut and screw, and then as you tighten that wing nut and screw, um, it tightens the actuator. So I have a few people commenting that they don't have any audio. Can anybody hear me? Um, type in if you can hear me, because I show everything is on on our side. Okay, so some people can hear. So if it it may be the, your connection if you're not able to hear. So sorry about that. We're recording it, so you'll be able to hear it in the recording. Okay, the actuated control valve manufacturers, if you're looking at a spec and you want to see what product is in the specification, these are the names that you would look up. Um, I'm sure in different territories, you'll have different people with different strengths. That is kind of the benefit of our universal mounting plate is the valves themselves, all the benefit of the valve is in the next generation stem, the low torque seal, the optimizer insert, all of those benefits you can get with any of your name brand actuators. So you're able to combine the benefit of our valve with the actuator from anybody else. We do also offer um, Siemens and KMC actuators at Griswold if you're interested in one of those brands. But you can see that you know all of these name brand control valve manufacturers make actuators that are compatible with our products. So I want to talk about types of actuation. We want to talk about this first because this actually plays into sizing products. So before we can talk about how to size a valve, we need to talk about the types of actuation. 
So there are three main different types um, of actuators. Uh, the first one is on off or two position. So the actuator basically has two signals that it receives. One signal says rotate clockwise, another signal that says rotate counterclockwise, basically to open or close the valve. Now, some actuator manufacturers have actually done away with on off. Um, they don't even offer it as an option. Siemens being one, they have it in some of their fail safe, but not all. So more and more, the, on, the pure on off where it's just open or closed um, is not being offered for these quarter turn style actuators, um, but it is a common style for any time where you just want either your coil to have heating or cooling and you don't want it to have heating or cooling. So you're not trying to do any kind of controls. The next type that actually is the most popular is called tri-state or three-point floating. So you'll see it mentioned multiple different ways, um, but tri-state and three-point floating are the most common. So the actuator has three signals. One signal that says to rotate clockwise, a second signal that says rotate clock counterclockwise, and then a third one that says stop right where you are. So some people call this poor man's modulating because you can imagine you can rotate it clockwise, you can rotate it counterclockwise, but you could also tell it to stop in the middle. So you don't get true modulating in that you can't drive the actuator to a specific position, but it's poor man's modulating because you could stop at any position um, within the actuator range. And these actuators typically have about a 90 second rotation, 90 to 108 seconds. Um, we do offer some faster actuators for heat pumps, but in general for HVAC, most control valves, they want to have over a minute to actuate it to full open or full close. And that's partially because they don't want to have noise from flow changes. They don't want to have extreme swings in flow from changing it quickly. Um, but because of that, you can make your three-point floating or your tri-state act more as modulating because your control system can be programmed to rotate it counterclockwise for 20 seconds and then stop. Rotate counterclockwise another 20 seconds. So you really can, it, depending on your control system and how much the controls uh, con contractor wants to really program it, they could really fake the modulating with this three-point floating actuator. Now a true modulating, the third type, it has a signal that you can open or close it to any finite point between fully open and closed. So it's much finer control, it's more expensive. Um, the three-point floating is probably, in most cases, about half the price of modulating. So the modulating really does have um, a big uptick in price when you go full modulating. But with full modulating, you're getting the best control, really. Your control system, as it gets calls for heating or cooling, can modulate to in many different positions. And so you can really fine-tune your control better. The second main type of actuation is the power remove position. So the signal controls how the actuator moves when there is power. In a um, traditional actuator, when power is removed, nothing happens. So that would be a non-fail safe. The actuator would just stop right where it's at and it would not move. In a fail safe, there's either a spring inside or a capacitor inside that will drive the actuator to either a normally open or normally closed position. So this makes sense in some applications where if you do have a power outage, you don't want your heating to fully go away or you don't want your cooling to fully go away. So you wanna drive it to either fully open or fully closed. So in a hospital situation, in a, uh, computer room situation where you need to make sure that you have safety so that it does move to some uh, position for either getting cooling or getting heating, that would be fail safe. Price wise, fail safe also doubles typically the actuator price. So a non fail safe actuator is going to be substantially less expensive than a fail safe actuator. So from a competitive standpoint, you always want to find out what the signal is, because that has a huge impact on your um, actuation and your price. And then you want to find out what your power remove position is, because that has a big impact on your price. Um, there's other variables with actuators. 
how fast they are, whether they're 45 seconds or 90 seconds. Um, most of the ones we that we see are 90 seconds to 108, and that's acceptable for most HVAC. Um, there's 24 volt versus 120 volt for the power. Um, those are all options that you have with the actuators, but the biggest price impact you're gonna see in these two areas. And again, the, the impact to sizing is substantial with the signal. So now I wanna talk about control valve sizing. And I know when I started working on the Unimizer in 1999, 98, um, I, was under the impression that it was the craziest thing to size and it was hard. And, and so when I actually found out how they do it, I kept thinking there was something I was missing. So it actually is very simple to size a control valve. Um, we're gonna do it the hard way first, and then at the end, we'll give you the easy way. But the hard way teaches you some of the rules of thumb and some of the principles behind sizing. So that's why I wanna start from scratch and go back to the beginning. So this is our basic formula. You know, I love formulas. And so you saw this formula in our previous ones where the flow is equal to the CV times the square root of the delta P. You can rearrange this formula and we will be using both of these versions where the CV is equal to the flow divided by the square root of the pressure differential. So it's the same formula, just rearranged. And this formula is used for all control valve sizing. Um, so there is, with most controls contractors, somebody is having to use these formulas to select a product. They're having to use the formula to figure out their ideal CV, and then they're having to use the formula to find out from what they picked what the pressure differential is. So you can see um, in these formulas how pressure and CV and flow are all related. So we'll look at a sample. So in some, in some situations, you're asked to provide a valve and they give you the flow rate and they give you the pressure drop. And that's an ideal situation because they've told you what pressure drop they want. And that, that does happen actually, probably half the time when someone asks me for help, someone has told me I'd like the pressure drop to be around three, around four, or they give me a range. So because the pressure drop is being used for pump head calculations and all of that, it's entirely possible that you will get this inquiry where you have the flow and you have the pressure differential. <clears throat> so in this case, we have a flow of nine and a pressure drop of five. And so we wanna know what is the CV. So our formula, CV is the flow divided by the square root of the pressure drop. So basically four um, equals nine divided by the square root of five. So that means we need a CV of four. Now. This is where, again, if you were with us last week in balancing, we talked about how the ideal world, someone has calculated they need a CV of four to have really good control for this control valve. And we know that they don't because not everyone has the exact CV that is required. And so the rule of thumb is to pick the next higher CV. So in doing that, you've now created a situation where the valve is bigger. And so that takes us back to why automatic balancing flow limiting valves are very, very important. So that was last week's presentation, but I just wanted to point out here that it happens every day, control valves are sized. You figure out your ideal CV, then you go to someone's literature. And so we know, this is a snapshot of our literature, we wanted a CV of four. Well, I'm not gonna drop down to 2.6, so my next one is gonna be 4.7. So if I wanted a half inch valve, I could do a half inch valve at 4.7. If I wanted a three quarter inch valve, I could do a uh, CV of 4.3. And then if I wanted a one inch, the CV of 4.4. So I have three options. Typically, pricing goes up as you go in size. So that tells you the least expensive one will be half inch. For Griswold, we don't have as much of a price difference between those sizes, half and three quarter. But if someone's just looking at it and they haven't told you the size, to be competitive, you might pick the half inch um, with the CV of 4.7, but you could also pick with the CV of uh, 4.3 and the three quarter inch. <clears throat> so what that means though is that now, and this is what, a lot of controls contractors have someone in their office that's doing, 
when they've sized it, they said they wanted an ideal CV of four. And if you look at a valve schedule, you may see these columns. You'll see design pressure drop, design flow, CV, and they've calculated, we want a CV of four. Then they put the actual CV. And so the actual CV would be filled in by you, yourself, or us at Groswald, where we put in, okay, we're going to select a CV of 4.3. Then you go back to this equation. We'll go back more. Go back to this equation and we'll rearrange it so that we can figure out what is the pressure drop. So the valve schedule and the valve schedule that Fast Price does and the valve schedule that will be coming in Quick Quote actually will put this into the valve schedule. What is the pressure drop at the CV? So you can provide to the controls contractor when you submit something that, okay, I had a CV of 4.3, so therefore my pressure drop is going to be a little bit higher at my flow rate. So that is when you know what the flow is and you know what the pressure differential is. Now, sometimes you get asked for a control valve and you're only told what the flow is. And so you need to know a few different rules of thumb to be able to do this. If you don't have the pressure drop and you don't have the CV, you're going to have to know some rules of thumb. And those are based on the actuator signal. So in an on-off, or a tri-state valve being used as on-off, so either situation, your goal is a low pressure drop across the valve. Um, so that's, that's the end goal. So some people just stop right there and they just do this last one where they try to make the PSID less than 0.5 to one. Some people don't even do that, they just pick the biggest CV and the pipe size that they need. So if they know they need a half inch valve, they just pick the biggest CV. Um, that would be probably the most normal. If you know your branch pressure, you can use your branch pressure from you know the strainer, the hose, all of that, and you can add that all up and make your control valve about 10% of the branch. Um, but like I said, probably most of the time, they're just selecting a valve that's the highest CV in the line size or one that has a very low pressure differential. Now, if it's a modulating application or a tri-state being used as a modulating application, then the goal is a high pressure drop. And the reason that you want a high pressure drop is authority. We talked about this a little bit last week in control valves and flow limiting valves working together. Um, but in a modulating application where you've got a control valve, you want a higher pressure drop because the higher the pressure drop, the more control or authority it has to control the flow. And that makes sense if you just think about hole size in product. The smallest hole, which is again the biggest pressure drop, because small holes, big pressure drops, the smallest hole is going to be what limits the flow. That's what's controlling the flow. So whatever has the highest pressure drop in that branch is going to therefore have the most authority. So there's formulas um, that people can use to calculate authority. Um, the for, we publish them in our sizing section and in our uh, calculators we have the formulas. But the formula is basically the pressure differential of the control valve divided by the pressure differential of the circuit. And so some people want the pressure differential of the control valve to be about 50% of that full branch. So there's many different rules of thumb um, for how to get that modulating. You can do it based on the coil. And so if you know the coil pressure drop, then you want your control valve pressure drop to be equal or greater than the coil pressure drop. Um, because that way you know that your control valve pressure drop is going to have the authority if it has a bigger pressure drop than your coil. You don't always know the coil pressure drop. So it's just become the default in the industry that you should make your pressure drop in a modulating application between three and five. That really grates on some people that go to the effort to calculate the branch pressure drop and pick a valve with really good authority. Um, I've talked to some of you guys in the past and that's been something that makes some of the control industry really bothered. Um, but in general, unfortunately, that's kind of become the rule of thumb that you want a pressure differential to be between three and five. Some will allow a pressure differential up to 10 
if you read Johnson Controls Handbook, for example, they recommend three to five, but then say, but well, you can go up to 10. So basically, the higher the pressure drop in your control valve, the more authority that control valve has to control the flow. And so you might think, well, why don't I just pick a really high pressure drop? Well, one, it does add in head loss to your index circuit. Um, but the really important reason for not is that a high pressure differential across a port increases your risk of cavitation. So cavitations, the effect that occurs when the fluid in the system or valve vaporizes and then converts back into liquid. And the more pressure differential you have across that port, the higher risk you have of that. So that's why the three to five has become somewhat accepted because it's not going, most systems that will not be at a risk for cavitation and yet it will be high enough to control the flow and be the authority. So in this situation that we were looking at, we knew we had a valve, um, a flow requirement of nine. So I'm gonna assume that we're doing modulating. So if you look at our chart, you may have noticed that we have this darker black box around two position app applications, and then we have a dark box around the three to five, which would be HVAC modulating applications. So looking at this, I want to go down this chart. The values in the chart are the flow rates. So the flow rates are in here at the different pressure differentials across the top. So here would be a three pound differential, 3.5, and the flow in gallons per minute would be this data. So I'm gonna look for nine GPM. Well, of course, it's not gonna be exact because um, we don't publish every single increment. But I can see that in the valve 4.7 CV, I have nine GPMs right about here. I can also see in the three quarter inch valve that 8.6 and 9.1, so I would be right about here for a three quarter inch valve. So I'm going to, that will meet my requirement for a modulating application. Either of those CVs will meet that requirement. And so you could pick either of these. Uh, either of these CVs for that situation. So this was just a very um, quick way of showing the sizing based on using formulas and using the charts, but actually the best way is our sizing calculator. This is a screenshot of the computer program. We do have it on the iPhone and the Android as well. But the computer program takes you through the exact same steps that we did here. Um, but it asks you questions to help guide you to where you want to be. So you pick your product, whether it's automizer, unimizer, two-way, three-way. Then again, very important that you pick your application type, whether it's on-off, modulating, or tri-state. If you pick tri-state, another box comes up saying, is it on-off or modulating? And as you go through and select, you'll have this little stoplight. Green means this is a pretty good selection. Yellow means cautious and red means this is not a good selection. And so as you get the little warning errors, we'll say, for example, you've picked a CV that's giving you a pressure drop that's too high, so try to pick a lower CV. And so we'll try to guide you in using the traffic lights into something that's green, preferably green, worst case, if we can't get to green, something that's yellow. So this sizing guide, the reason I like the desktop version is because then you can open Excel and add it to Excel and create a valve schedule based on all of your selections and that valve schedule will then fill in, here is your actual valve DP. Because again, sometimes you're given the actuated valve DP like we were um, in the first example and so you know <clears throat> that what you're giving them is a little bit different and so you want them to be aware. You can also use this section down here. If they've given you their ideal PSID, you can input it right here. Oh. You can put it right there. And then as you're, you can fill in, uh, it will tell you what CV will work for that PSID. So it will calculate it for you. So this is the easy way to do valve sizing. And, but like I said, all of the, sizing information is right here. You can see the little guideline section where we say everything I basically just taught you is in this section. If the coil del delta P is known, it should be equal. If it's not known, three to five. So all of those guidelines are right there in this program as well.
So now I want to talk about the next two categories in actuated valves. The first being the automatic combination valve and the second, the pressure independent. So I know we talked about this um, in our previous, so we didn't go into as much detail, but the same principles for valve sizing apply in the automizer as they do in the unimizer. So when someone calls you and says they want five GPM, you do your normal sizing for your cartridge and you pick a cartridge that's close to or a little bit higher than what they've requested. Then you have to do the CV selection in the automizer portion, the ball portion. So it's the same exact process as the unimizer for sizing. You just have the extra step of adding in the cartridge. That's why um, here when we have, if you, I had clicked automizer, this is not live, it's just a screenshot. But if I had clicked automizer, it would show up with what cartridge do you want and what PSID range. So there's two steps. It's the exact same steps that everyone has done for years. It's just being done at the same time in the same valve. For years, the mechanical has sized this actuated or the flow limiting section and the controls contractor has sized this. Now you're doing it all at once in the automizer valve. So that's the automizer valve. The pressure independent valve is actually much easier to size. I think Belimo's done a very good job actually in minimizing or simplifying how controls contractors view sizing because they've said, hey, you don't have to size anything. You don't have to pick a CV. You don't have to size and run any calculations because the pressure independent valve does it all. You just say 5 GPM and it's done. And that's very true. There's no calculation required to pick your CV. Um, there's no calculating to figure out what your pressure drop is. Uh, for the actuated valve portion, you just pick the flow rate that you want for the pressure independent valve. So it's a much simpler process. It's almost like picking just your balancing valve, but your actuated valve is included with it. A pressure independent valve by design should always have a modulating actuator on it. If it doesn't have a modulating actuator, there's really no reason to use a pressure independent valve. If it's an on off or a three point floating actuator that's not being used as uh, modulating, then you're basically fully opening that control valve and then fully closing it. And there's no need to control the pressure independent of pressure changes in the system at all those reduced po points below full open because your valve is not. So in, in those cases, the automizer would be the better product for anything on off. And it, it really does bother me when I see Belimo quoting a three point or an on off actuator on a pressure independent valve, because but really they're just getting full open actuation and full closed actuation. And the cartridge is just maintaining flow at a full open position. That's exactly what the automizer does at a fraction of the price. So a pressure independent valve should always be sold with a modulating actuator. Now you'll get quote requests where they don't ask for that. And uh, in those cases, I would encourage you to try to convince them to do the automizer because it's a less expensive valve and there's no need for the pressure independent if they're not doing modulating. So we talked about the pressure independent valve and how it, um, the differences between that and the automizer, but I wanted to revisit it a little bit in this presentation. The actuated pressure independent valve has the same unimizer ball valve in it, just like the automizer, just like the unimizer. So we've got an optimizer insert in here, and that same insert is in the ball, and that's controlling the flow. In a pressure independent valve, we have a pressure differential regulator. So the cartridge in this valve is different. It is not designed to maintain a constant flow. It's designed to maintain a constant pressure drop across this ball. So that's why the pressure independent valve is ideal and for modulating applications, because when this ball is in a partially closed position, it has a specific flow rate. There's a, a certain hole size in the ball, and so therefore it has a specific CV, and that's a, a certain flow. Now, if there's a pressure differential change across that ball, the flow would go up. That would be how any actuated valve in the market, that's what would happen. Pressure change across the ball, the flow goes up, the flow goes down, 
And so eventually the thermostat gets a signal and so it rotates the, the valve to more closed or more open. And so you have cycling that's occurring in all actuated valves that don't have some kind of balancing with them. Well, in a pressure independent valve, you've got that cycling valve, but when it's done moving and it's the zone satisfied, now if there's pressure changes in that system, because again, this is a hydronic system and everything's changing constantly because someone in some room has done something. Now, if there's a pressure differential change, the pressure differential across that ball is maintained constant. So there's no flow change that occurs. So that means that your actuator life is greatly extended. Instead of the actuator having to rotate every time there's a load change and every time there's a pressure change, now your actuator only has to rotate when there's a load change. And that's a small part of the time. The load changes don't occur nearly as much as the pressure differential changes that require the actuator to move. So a pressure differential valve, the actuator life should be doubled if not more because you're using your actuator a fraction of the time. You're really only using the actuator when there's a load change and there's a need to change um, the load in the room itself. So the pressure independent valve has the added benefit of the extended life to the actuated control valve portion. With that, it also has the added benefit just to the user comfort because you're getting the flow that you need. And then when there's a pressure change, it maintains constant. So the pressure independent valve is like the cream of the crop for the actuated control valves. You've got plain actuated control valves, and then the pressure independent is a whole other level because it does maintain that constant flow. So that is the summary of the Griswold actuated valve product line. Um, are there any questions? I have one, let's see, does the manual override handle come with the actuator or with the bare valve? Yes, the handle comes with the actual valve that we sell. So all of our valves have this black handle right here that uh, sits on top of the actuator. That was one question in the chat. I'll go ahead and unmute and see if there's any other questions. Hey, Kristen. Yes. Hey, this is Hans in Hayward. Hey, Hans. Hey, hi. Hey, I, I noticed uh, earlier on you mentioned about, you know, these, uh, uh, the valves, you know the 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 life of the um, actuators due to the amount of the you know they're they're changing yeah. their position so it can limit it. You know we have in our trading area some engineers or respected engineers that don't even they say forget the balancing portion of it. Let the temperature control valve you know do the balancing right. and you know, that's going to actuate a heck of a lot more and really reduce that amount of yeah. life in the actuator. So. That's again where the pick V just is such a solid, you know, right. uh, uh, payback for that. Yeah, you know, I have read the articles in ASHRAE that periodically come up about that topic, about using the actuated valve to balance the system because basically the actuated valve is just going to cycle every time. And the life time of that actuator is so drastically reduced when you're constantly cycling. I was our rep in Canada for a while was working on some projects where they were comparing those type of scenarios. And the time it took to get to set point was over 10 minutes. Whereas if the balancing valve was there, it was immediately at, you know, once the modulating valve was done modulating, then the balancing valve just maintained it at that maximum flow. And so it was a drastic difference also in occupant comfort because it took a lot longer to fine tune and get to that set point because the modulating actuator was having to constantly modulate. So I, I've seen that as well. I don't see the value in, you know, cutting your actuator life so dramatically when a balancing valve can help with that situation. But like you said, a pressure independent valve really solves that problem perfectly um, so that, that, you know, then that pressure independent valve will have the even longer life lifespan. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a great point. And, and you're at, you're at control point way more than you are if you're letting it try to balance. 
Yes, yeah, exactly. Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah, thanks, Hans. Any other questions or comments? Ice cream, ice cream truck is here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. <laughs> All right. Well, All right. I appreciate well, you guys appreciate joining you guys us. Joining us. It's been a good, been a good uh, three uh, training three sessions. Training sessions. So oh, thanks for taking so the time. For taking the time. Have a great Good day. Stuff. Have a Thank great day. Stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Thanks.